around the world, it's all open things that I can have so I know what's, what's going on in the industry. And the main reason why I look at these job openings is no, I'm not looking, but I want to make sure what you teach here in the Atlantic is relevant to what you need to know as you're working. This is what process monitoring is about, reducing the variance in the process. Okay? So these sorts of skills we're learning here in course are extremely relevant in companies. The fact that they're looking here for a master's or a PhD is irrelevant. This sort of job posting is also available for people without master's and PhD degrees. What we're going to learn in today's class does not require a master's degree. It's a trivial application of data analysis. We learned in the first week of this course about visualizing data. We've spent the subsequent few classes on a section of univariate statistics, developing confidence intervals, and summarizing data. This section brings both of those together. We're going to apply those two topics and develop a system that allows you to, in real time, find the problems in the process. So visualizing your data in real time and applying these ideas of univariate statistics. Now, Let's be clear here, our aim is to detect the problem. Rapid problem detection. This is critical. You do not want to wait four hours or eight hours or two weeks later for your customer to come back and say to you, you shipped really bad product to me. You want to detect this problem rapidly so that you can fix it and avoid all specification production, avoid all the costs of reworking, avoid the cost of scrapping material that you don't want. So this ties in very nicely with 4N, where we look at troubleshooting. We're going to develop a system here today that will detect the problem. The skills you learned in 4N, how to troubleshoot the process, is what you do next. So we, we, we'll, what we're going to learn today, we're not going to learn how to diagnose the problem, what actually went wrong. We're going to develop a system that will point out to you, wait, something is going wrong right now. Okay, that's all we're doing, is detecting when something is going wrong. It's then up to you to use your functioning skills and your brain to figure out what went wrong. Many companies will try to sell you systems that will, they claim will diagnose the problem for you. It is next to impossible to do that. These automated expert systems do not work very well. You have to use your brain as an engineer. Your knowledge of the process is very, very strongly involved here and how to fix the problem. That's why we cannot teach this. Because I can teach it to you for one distillation column at a petrochemical company, but it's not going to work for a waste worksheet. But what will always work in every industry is this step. How to know that right now something is not going right. So here's a few things that you may have seen. If you've ever been in an emergency, I was a few years ago, and when they had you hooked up to all their ECGs and heart rate monitors, I could watch my monitoring chart on the screen next to me. It's also on a remote station at the nurse's terminal so she or he could watch it. And that person then can react and do exactly what I said. They can detect right away when there's a problem and they can get someone in to diagnose it or they diagnose it themselves. And they can adjust me to the process, my body, to fix the problem. So you've seen those, you've seen them on TV shows if you haven't been in an emergency yourself. If any of you um, trade stocks, one of the ways of trading stocks that you may have learned about is using technical analysis. You plot charts that show the trends in today of what's happening, and you can make buy and sell decisions based on some of those numbers. That's a, a monitoring chart as well. Take action, buy or sell, based on what you see. If you've done a co-op term, you've been in the operator's control rooms, and you've seen those standard control charts. I will have a few examples near the end of this um, section of the course. So not, not the next class, but the class after. 
you may, or hopefully, you will all graduate before that Excel building is built. The, we just got approval for it the other day, back in December. And a few meetings that I've been to on that, they're doing some sort of phenomenal things. How are we using the data from that building, if possible, and build the system so that in real time we can collect all the end end usage in that building. Real time collection of heat flux through the walls of the building. And we can monitor those in charts and show how that building is behaving and how it's operating. Now, by the way, I'm very disappointed that every meeting I go to, I've never seen anyone from chemical engineering. You guys are being left behind because mechanical engineering is claiming all the space in that building. Mechanical, electrical, and mechatronics. I, I can't say the new space for chem engineering because the day set up building is a building for all the students to run by the students. Okay, so you guys must organize and make sure that you claim the space in that building. Um, that's just by the way. Okay, so here's, here's some examples where we're going to use this, this material in today's class. So we'll go over the to you something about our product. Is it stable? So product dimensions, some product quality, viscosity, some metric. Are these stable over time or are they varying? We want stable processes. Remember a few classes back, we said we would love if our processes had flat lines with very little variation. It makes life easy for us. It means our customers are happy with our consistent product. Another question you could ask is how do we think we detect if there is something going wrong? We're going to learn about that in today's class and next classes. How rapidly can we detect these drifts? Your manager wants to track the hourly average profit. When I was working for the, that lumber company up in Temescu a few years ago, all the data from the real-time collection systems from those lasers that I pointed out was being summarized, and that computer system was sending the data to the office in Montreal, the head office in Montreal, and they were monitoring the process remotely in real time, tracking the hourly profit produced at that size. You can be sure that if someone's watching that system sees the hourly profit drop, they're going to be on the phone right away saying, what the heck is going on at this site? So these systems exist, they're, they're used, but we, we don't use them sensibly. We want to be able to put them online, but then react when something's going wrong. So how do we calculate what those limits are when we start to react and when we don't react? And then the final part of this topic looks at the CPK or process capability. So many of you have heard about Six Sigma or, uh, on a show of hands we had in the class the other day. Many of you are well aware of CPK, Six Sigma. You've seen these terms in your, in your, uh, in your previous problems, perhaps. We're going to learn exactly what that Six Sigma means and what it doesn't mean. Some, some people interpret it incorrectly and we need to know exactly what it means. So, that sets the scene for where we're going. One thing to be aware of, people often criticize these methods as being reactive and not proactive. That's quite okay. Most of our improvements to our process are always based on something that's gone wrong and then we react to it. So it's a very good strategy to actually improve and incrementally improve your process. So we're going to start with today's class with these first two topics. We'll look at some definitions and we'll get to the shoe on chart. Next time we'll look at the Houston chart briefly and the next section where we're using average chart. This next section then will end off with is on cost and capability. That's the six sigma section and uh, I'll show a few industrial examples. Okay, so as I said in the, the class a few, uh, a few weeks ago, that quality really isn't optional these days. There was this attitude in the 80s and the 70s that spending budget or money on Improving the quality of the process is kind of, well, if we had money left over, we'll, we'll do this. But it's really not seen as a trade-off anymore. People recognize that having a good quality product means you retain your customers, even if it may take a long time for your customers to realize the value of the product. But we have this mentality that a good brand or a good quality product is something we're going to return back to. We see that often in, in car sales. It's taken a long time, but the North American market of car sales is dominated by non-North American dealers. So the Asian manufacturers from Korea, from Japan, have dominated the auto industry now in North America for a number of years. So that's starting to change. Ford is one of the leaders in that field. Ford applies regular Six Sigma um, topics in their, in their production. These process monitoring charts 
they will come to the man, their supplier site and audit them to make sure they're using these systems before they become a, a supplier that's able to sell to Ford. So these companies are starting to recognize that quality is an important part of their uh, systems. Okay, so let's take a look at what a control chart looks like. Here's an example of one down here. And it's monitoring the tank temperature. It's got this tag TC241, so there's some numerical value, and it's measured in degree C. Features of the control chart are three horizontal lines. The first is this midline, 10, my target. That represents my desired operating temperature to be. So the target value should be shown. As it on the control chart, you may see one or more limit lines, usually shown in red or orange. The lower control limit, LCL, and the upper control limit, in this case, there's two limit lines. And what we'll do is we'll display the data from this tank temperature in real time, or as close to real time as we possibly can. So when I say that to some companies, this data point will be the data point that's on the system right now, or at least one or two seconds ago. In some companies, there may be a bit of a latency there, and that data point may be a minute or an hour ago. But if we try to put the data as close to real time as possible, obviously that's the reason for that is because if something's going wrong, we don't. It's hard to react to something that was wrong an hour ago. Things have actually changed in that past, so it's hard to diagnose. If we can diagnose the problem right now, we can usually diagnose it correctly. So we, we like to have these charts shown in real time, and when you go into a control room, you won't just see one of these; you'll see several. So how do companies pick which one to monitor? They use their knowledge internally of what the variables are that are most strongly related to quality. So that's often called CTQs, critical to quality variables. So they monitor their CTQs. You could monitor every variable that you measure in the process. But some variables that you measure are not that useful and, and some variables do not impact quality. So monitoring them may not be the most appropriate use of the valuable computer space that you've got in an operating monitoring screen. Okay, so we usually limit the number of charts we show to only those that are really the important ones. And the types of charts that the, these will be are clearly time series charts or sequence plots. So here I've shown that a sequence of the last 200 data points available in my process. So some companies will choose a numeric index like I've shown here, but more usefully and it's to replace this x-axis with a time-based axis. Example. This is another another company I work with in Quebec, and they were monitoring the flotation cell. So many of you are familiar with the flotation cell. This is a schematic of one, and up here is a video camera that takes an image of the surface of the prop, and it is used and they calculate values from that data, from that image, and they use that to control the process. Many companies that run flotation circuits have that as a manual system. The manual system is not a camera, but it's an operator who goes and visually looks at the prop, and she or he goes and makes an adjustment to the process. So it's still a feedback control loop, except it's a person who's the controller. The more sophisticated companies will put a camera in place, have those calculations done automatically, and then adjust using feedback automatically, so, so they can do it a little faster than waiting for an operator to be present. So let's take a look at what some of those, those photos look like taken by the camera. Uh, that's what a plot looks like at the top. So this so is a It's just, this is a, this I believe is, if I remember correctly, was uh, zinc being floating here. And the operator is looking at the size of those bubbles. They're also looking at the distribution of the, of the shape of them. So many of them you see are they're not spherical bubbles. Now with time, I'll just skip through them over time, that plot is changed. This is what the camera is seeing. So the operator is looking at two major things. The shape and size of those bubbles and the color distribution of the color. Both of the 
those numbers can easily be computed automatically. So I take this image data, I'll talk about the image data and what it looks like numerically at different classes from now, but it's very easy to take those image data and numerically calculate the average color and the average bubble size from them. So my colleague and I built a little software package to do that, and I'll show you what the monitoring system then looked like. So here the company is monitoring the bubble size in the top graph in millimeters. There's my upper control limit and my lower control limit. And here on the lower graph, I'm plotting the median grayscale color. So a zero value represents black, and a 255 represents white. The fact that this is average around 50 indicates clearly that it's a darker shade so they could monitor this in real time. And the key is, as long as those data lie within the limits, you don't take any action. Now something's happened. Something's caused a shift in your process, so your bubble diameters have gotten smaller, and your average base scale color has started to get larger. Now that's when you take action. So the key is, you do not take action when you're within the limits. So let's just go back here. As long as my process is operating within those limits, I don't tamper with it. There is a strong temptation for operators and engineers to kind of go and tweak their valves and play with the process because you're going to be doing something, right? You've just been walking around, not changing anything in the process. But we learned a few classes back that manipulating your process, you're actually introducing variability. Every time I go to adjust that valve, I'm changing the variability in my process, and it's going to have an impact on the downstream quality. So this rule is, as long as you're within those limits, there's no need to adjust your process. As long as you're within those limits, you're producing good quality products. So these control charts are a way to determine whether, first, you're producing good quality products, and secondly, they're giving you a definitive signal when it's time to act. You do not act when you're within the limits. You only take action when you're outside the limits. Okay, so we're going to define those terms a bit more carefully next time. So here's, here's one distinction I do want to be clear. SPC, statistical process control, you saw that there in that job posting when I started the class. That is another term for process monitoring. I do not use it because there's the potential confusion that you consider process control that you learned about in 3P and 4E as the same thing. They're very different in fact. Process control is not statistical process control. Statistical process control, or what I will call process monitoring, is similar in very few aspects, but it's completely different in most other regards. So it's very similar to regular feedback control only in the sense that you're always applying it. So a regular feedback control system is an automatic tool that's always running in the background and keeping your process on target. The regular feedback control system is always monitoring for deviations from set points, and it will take action as soon as it sees a, a small deviation from set points. Only in those two regards is process monitoring the same. Process monitoring is also continually applied, and we check for deviations from the target. But in all other respects, it's very different. Process monitoring, we do not take action unless required. The feedback control system, that manipulated variable, is always moving up or down and changing the valve positions and adjusting the process to keep it on target. Process monitoring, those adjustments that you make to your process are infrequent. In process control, you're always, at every time step, determining whether I should take an action or but in process monitoring, you only take action when you see it leaving those, those bounds. So as long as you're within those control limits, you cannot take action. So your adjustments that you make to your process are very, very important. Because most of the time, you should be within those limits, producing good quality products. And when you do take action in process monitoring, that action is manual. This is a manual intervention that you go to your process and recognize, okay, hang on, something is wrong. If we go back to that flotation example, my bubble size started to drop. Something has changed in my process that's caused the bubble size to drop. 
using my troubleshooting techniques that we learned before, and to figure out what that is. Let's assume we've solved that problem and we've learned that it changed in the chemistry of the ore feed coming into my process. So how do I recognize that? If it's a change in the chemistry of my process, something is different to before. I go and take a manual action. I go and adjust some of the reagents that I add to my frothing to counteract that. So it's a manual step by step. It's not an automatic step. And I only adjust it to what are called special causes. So a special cause is something that's unusual, not a regular event in the process. Okay, so let's, let's be clear here. Process marketing makes, makes an adjustment to your process that's usually permanent to reduce the variability. Feedback control makes regular adjustments to your process and it's for a temporary compensation and it's done in an automated way. So, so we should not, not, never confuse those two. Okay, now here's the, here's the approach you'll follow, and I'll have you think about this in the next slide. We go through three phases. The first phase, what I call phase zero, and I call it phase zero because phase one and two are the standard terms in, in textbooks. So the only way that I can fit in another phase is to call it phase zero. Phase zero is select the variable that you want to monitor. Many companies do not think about phase zero. Phase zero is critical. Because I, if I don't think carefully about which variable to monitor, I'm either going to end up with no monitoring charts, or I'm going to end up with 50 or 60 or multiple monitoring charts, and my operator's going to have no idea what to monitor. So phase zero is deciding what to monitor. The second phase, or phase one, that's called phase one in the textbooks, is to build your charts. Now, this terminology gets confused by students regularly in this course. So let's be clear here. Phase one is offline. You take a batch of data from your process and you find what those control limits are. That's all that phase one is related to. It's finding your upper control limit, finding your lower control limit, and your target point. <coughs> you do that offline and you do that based on historical data, or data that's in the past. And there's a bit of iteration here that we'll talk about. When that's complete, phase two is the next step, and that's where you go put this charts online and you start to actually use it. So it's implementing the chart on new data that's never been seen before by the process. And you implement it almost always with computer systems. And it's for real time as well. So phase one is offline, phase two is online. Phase one is on historical data, phase two is on data right now. I'd like you to go back to phase zero now. Phase zero is a step where we decide what to monitor. And let's a look at these cases and discuss with the person next to you, um, in pairs or in threes or whatever is convenient, discuss for these industries what you would monitor. Pick the industry that appeals most to you and your partner, or pick another industry. It doesn't need to be what's listed here. So some of you might be interested in wastewater treatment, some of you in farm or tablets, oil and gas, food processing, Minerals industry, plastics industry, whatever whatever you find fascinating. And take a minute or two to talk to your person there and decide what you will want.
measurements that are tracked in the pharmaceutical industry. Very few online metrics that are tracked in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, pharmaceutical industry is unusual because of primarily batch processes. Can we apply these tools we've learned here in a, on a batch process? Does a batch process have a half control and a low? Does a batch have a target? considered to be running from beginning to end in an adequate manner. And the company can get to the end of this batch and say, we probably don't need to do too much laboratory testing on this batch. It progressed and stayed within the limits throughout the run. The bad batch, though, would have proceeded along these lines. At the initial time point, it exceeded the 95% limit. And about midway during the batch, it exceeded the 95% limit again. This batch would be isolated and have extensive laboratory test work done on it before it's released and packaged. Or it may have to be scrapped depending on the outcome of those lab tests. But monitoring systems, batches do exist. The only difference is that those limits are not flat lines. So we're actually dealing with a simpler case in this course of so continuous processes with constant operating. But these, uh, these systems do exist for batch processes, which are mostly seen in pharmaceuticals and Production. So let's come back here to a process that's often done continuously. What do you monitor in heterocare? Vapor liquid content, so compositions. Okay, that's a liquid contact. Can you monitor that in real time? Classical measures that are seen in the patient care. Pressure, temperature, composition, flow, and level. Easy to measure, easy to acquire at very, very high sampling rates and cheaply and reliably. Anything else? 
some of the derived values. You can derive vapor liquid equilibrium and you can then predict what the vapor pressures will be based on some of these input variables. So you can then calculate the function of temperature and other variables. You can go calculate vapor liquid equilibrium by vapor pressure, I should say. And then you can go monitor that calculated variable. So there's no need to limit yourself to only the variables that you actually measure. You can be as creative as you like and can be and measure any calculated variables based on the raw data that you actually do measure. So never limit yourself to what you've got in your database. You can always do far more. Food industry. What would you be monitoring in the food industry? Temperature. Which you're producing that food? Color. Color? So the fryer, you want the level of oil, probably? The level of oil and temperature. Weight. Weight. Packaging, especially. Composition such as sodium level, for example. Okay, compositions, smell. Yeah, absolutely. Smell. There's electronic noses. So these are noses on a chip that measure um, those volatile organic compounds and measure their concentrations. So it's called a nose. Okay, so mineral industry. Quite a developer from the 1920s by Walter Schumann. 
is a child for monitoring location or position of your variable. It has three lines, a target line, a lower control limit, and an upper control limit. So a sure child, because it's monitoring for location, it must always have a target. That line where you want the process to be the location where you ideally would like all your product to be produced. But we're saying my process is not going to always be within that first limit. So here between time 0 and time 150, my process is within the limits. And up to time 150, my process is called to be in control. Around time 150, something happens. There's an assignable cause. Something is occurring for my process to start moving. Now notice here that I see an upward trend. I don't have to wait to leave that control limit before I take action. The rule is that if you're outside those control limits, something unusual is taking place. However, we'll learn later on that if there's a sequence of observations which all are above the line or all are below the target, that also that's very unusual and you should take action. So there's nothing stopping you from taking action a little earlier if you're watching this. Okay? However, the fact that you're exceeding these lines is an indicator that something unusual has gone wrong. Don't take action if you're between your lines. Do not tamper with the process if you're in control. Only touch and alter the process if you're out of control. How do we calculate those control limits? So here's, here's where the math begins. This is phase one, deriving those control limits. So we remember we said phase one was to calculate the upper and lower control limits. Here's how we do it. Consider your raw data on your process. I've got raw data sample 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7 coming from my database. This is historical data. Remember phase 1, the big notice here on the slide, this is for phase 1. So this represents historical data, data that's already occurred in the past. I go to my database and collect these. And I will decide to take a subgroup of the samples. I will talk about how you choose your subgroup in a minute. But let's choose five samples as my subgroup size. Calculate the average of those five values. We call it x bar 1. Move over to the next five values. So 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Calculate those average. We call it x bar 2. And I repeat going on x bar 3, x bar 4. These are what we're going to monitor. We're not going to monitor our raw data. We're going to monitor our x bars. x bar is the summary of these n values, the average of them, and it's going to be normally distributed based on the central value here. We know that by now. Our original data, x1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on, comes from n distribution with mean of mu and variance sigma squared. That's my original data. x bar comes from the normal distribution now, with the same mean, but with a different variance, sigma squared over n. So let's introduce a little bit of a shorthand notation. The square root of this variance, the standard deviation, I'll call sigma x bar. So x bar comes from a normal distribution with mean of mu and standard deviation of sigma x bar. Sigma x bar is just the square root of that variance term. It's the variance, or sorry, I should say standard deviation of my subgroup average. Now we, I'm assuming here this is a theoretical derivation. I'm assuming I know my target, mu, and I know my sigma of my process. I'm going to take those two assumptions away in a second. But for now, let's assume we know what my population, mu, and sigma are of my raw data. It's very important. Mu and sigma refer to the raw data and standard deviation. And we use sigma to find the upper and lower control limits. That should be clear to us and intuitive to us. The larger my process's sigma is, the larger my process's variance is spread, the wider those control limits are going to be. If my process is not stable at all, it's got a very high standard deviation, <coughs> I'm going to get wider limits. If my process is very well controlled, I'm going to get smaller limits or narrower limits. So that lower and upper control limit are going to be close to get. So sigma is what depends, is what's going to impact where those control limits lie, above and below 
the average mean. So here's how to think about it. Let the thin line here represent the histogram for my raw data. These are the single process measurements of my raw values. And I'm going to pick here, I've just, for this example, chosen mu and sigma. So this is, remember this is the theoretical derivation. I've chosen what my mean is. My process operates at six units, and it has a, a natural standard deviation, or a population standard deviation of two units. If I use five samples for my subgroup, so n is equal to five, Sigma x bar is going to be 2 divided by root 5. So 2 for my standard deviation divided by n, sorry, divided by root 10. My upper bound, this upper bound that I'm going to place here, this upper control limit, is going to be at the mean, mu, plus 3 standard deviations of x bar. And the lower bound is going to be mu minus 3 standard deviations. So that's the theoretical derivation for the upper control limit. Upper and lower control limits are going to be symmetrical about mu, and we're always going to choose three standard deviations up and three standard deviations down. So, if this thin line is my raw data, I can calculate my target based on the mean of the raw data, and the lower control limit and upper control limit are a function of my raw data's distribution. I haven't used anything from this black thicker curve yet. And so the, the control limits are only a function of your raw data. Now I go and say, well, x bar, the average of those n points, it's going to come from a distribution that you know to be also the normal distribution, but with a different variance, the variance called sigma x bar. So it's, if I plot that distribution over here, that's what the black curve looks like for the x bar values. This is the histogram for the subgroup averages. And notice how much of the area is enclosed by lower and upper controls. Pretty much all of the area in this pick up the curve histogram is enclosed by those bounds. In fact, we can go calculate that theoretically. The area under those, under that um, curve between the bounds is 99 and 73%. Or in other words, You've only got a chance of 1 in 370 that a new x bar value will lie outside those bounds. Those are very low, <coughs> low probabilities. We like that because the last thing you want to do is tell your operator to go and investigate a point that's outside the curve that really actually isn't problematic. So uh, that you've got a 1 in 370 chance that a new x bar will lie outside the curve when it's actually okay. So we'll talk about that in a few slides. Okay, so one thing, one other way that people sometimes conceive these control charts is they consider the lower control limit and upper control limit as confidence intervals. It's not really accurate to call them that. They're not confidence intervals because a confidence interval is for mu. We're not, we're not building a chart to find the range of mu. We're building a chart to monitor for variation. So, but, but we can, Conceptually, at least think of it that way, it's not technically accurate, but we'll just sort of do that. But we do use this derivation then to find how much the area is that lies outside the limit. That's 99 to calculate for these tables. The other thing here to notice is that we found with the X bar, we are not bound for the raw data values. So we're going to monitor X bar, we're not monitoring the raw data. Okay, now let's, let's go look at the real case. Now that we understand the theoretical case where we assume we know mu and we know sigma, what do we do when we don't have those data available to us? Well, our target is the easy one. It's very easy to find what my target should be. I can go do one of three things. The first, let's jump to the second and the third one before we look at that equation. The second option says just use what the target should be. So in many processes, we know that my final plot needs to be at a certain p needs to be at a certain B or B, or it needs to have a certain level of color. So it's very easy to find what my target is. I just go pick out my, what my specification should be. Or if you've got a lot of data available to you, presumably you're producing good quality product most of the time. Some companies don't. But if you are producing good quality product most of the time, 
the median of the log beta is going to be a good estimate of where your target should be. It's going to totally ignore all the outliers and calculate a fairly good central point for you. The other option is you could go use, and this is what we use when we're building these monitoring charts, is to go use the average of the averages. So x bar is an average of n samples. Let me collect capital K of those averages. So here's x bar 1, x bar 2, x bar 3, up to x bar capital K. And I just compute the average of those averages. So either any one of those three approaches is a good way to get a good target. How do we substitute for getting sigma? We don't know our population standard deviation. Well, one thing I can go do is I can go calculate the standard deviation of just those n values. If I go back up to this little plot here, I've got these five data points. Not only can I go calculate x bar, I can also go calculate the average, uh, sorry, I can go calculate the standard deviation of those five points. I'll get s1. And then I can go calculate the standard deviation of these next five points, the standard deviation of the next five. And then if I take the average of those standard deviations, I can get an estimate of the standard deviation. So that's what this formula says. Let's call SK the standard deviation of n values. If I go calculate the average standard deviation, I'm going to get capital S bar. Now capital S bar isn't quite an estimate for the standard deviation, for the population standard deviation. It's close, but it's certainly not quite, quite the same thing. So what we do is we correct it for it. We divide through by a correction factor that we theoretically calculate. And that just, we just read it at the table. Table also makes intuitive sense because it says the larger your sample size of n, the small, the, the closer that correction factor approaches one. So the amount that you correct by becomes less and less of a deal the more data you have in the subgroup size. So that's just a, just one thing to remember there. So then for sigma, I simply replace s bar over this correction factor. S bar is a function of the individual standard deviations for that calculate for my raw data. Take your raw data, calculate the standard deviations, calculate your s bar, correct for it, and then use that now as an estimate of sigma. So here you go. Here's the final equation for the lower control limit and upper control limit for an actual data set. You can go do this easily. X double bar minus three times that standard deviation. X double bar plus three times that standard deviation. So for next class, uh, please re-download this slide. I've updated it a little bit. Um, I'll post it on the website. And we'll work through this example for next time.